Hi, good morning, everybody. And thank you for being here so early. Thank you. Um, I'm David Branner. I'm going to give you a talk on, I, I imagine, what is um, an unexpected title. I'm going to claim that classical Chinese is a programming language in some sense. And I'll try to prove that to you today. Um, oh, I should tell you at the outset, um, the, the, the type on this screen is not going to get any smaller than this, but it's also not going to get bigger. And if you're having trouble seeing, there are still seats in the front. Maybe you would like to um, squeeze up. So I'm going to use the word Chinese and sometimes the word classical Chinese here. Um, I may use it carelessly, so I want to say at the outset what it is that I'm talking about. Uh, classical Chinese or literary Chinese is the written language of most of Chinese history. It was the main language of communication and diary writing and inscriptions until somewhere in the middle of the 20th century, if you look at the larger Chinese world. Um, it's not Mandarin. Mandarin is a spoken language. Classical or literary Chinese is a written language only. Um, and it may never have had a real spoken form. People argue about this because there were there were no recordings, unfortunately. But even if it was read aloud, if it was used to some extent in speech at court where you had to be very formal, um, it almost certainly belonged to what is called a high diglossic register. And all that means is that it was always connected, even when it came out of people's mouths, it was always connected to writing. So we're dealing with something different from what most of us experience now. Very few of us ever deal with an entirely written natural language uh, like Latin or Greek. I think very few people do that now. Um, so this language, classical Chinese, this written language, has had an enormous effect on Mandarin, this, the standard spoken language of China. Um, words, the way they're formed, to a great extent, follow the rules that I'm going to describe today. Um, in addition, the grammar of Mandarin can be built on top of the basis that I'm describing. You need other rules, but this is a good foundation. And furthermore, this, this classical Chinese thing is also found in the, the literate languages around China, in particular Korea and Japan and Vietnam until fairly recently. There's a lot of Chinese vocabulary in those languages. It's fully assimilated and so the same principles of word formation apply. Okay, so I'm gonna claim that classical Chinese grammar has approximately the order of simplicity, formal simplicity of a programming language rather than that of a natural language. And I'll um, show you what I mean. I'll try to show this at least using a context-free grammar, which I'll describe during the next half hour. And then I'll show you how, um, because it, uh, you, you, you get a lot of ambiguity when you have a highly compressed language like this, um, little things, little tweaks can be done to reduce the ambiguity. So that's, that's the point of this. So what is this language Chinese made of? It's made of words, and in order to talk about grammar, we have to talk about the types of words. And in natural languages, the type of a word is called its part of speech. And we abbreviate that as POS, so I'll probably use that throughout the slides. Um, we have in Chinese nouns and verbs, basically. That's basically all we have. It's a great system, a two-type system. Nouns, I think everybody knows this word. Um, a noun is a person, place, or thing, or it could be the name of a person, place, or thing. And for example, in Chinese, you don't need to pronounce it with me. Um, yes, Zhi is um, the sun. It also means day. It is written with this character. The characters will show up uh, here so that I know what I'm talking about and uh, Chinese readers will know what I'm talking about, but it's not part of the talk. Sun or day, it's a noun, right? It's a, it's a thing. Um, but the root or trunk of a tree it can also mean a fundamental issue. It's very common in philosophy to talk about the button or even you know, 
capital in the economic sense is the, the, the foundation of, um, of resources. B is a kind of hunting net um, with long handles used in antiquity. And here's the state of Chu, which is in southern China around the Wuhan area, Chu. Okay, so these are nouns, no big deal. And a verb can be an action, as you would expect. It can also be a state, and we associate states in English with adjectives. But in classical Chinese, there's a good case to be made that there's no difference between what we consider an adjective and what we consider a verb. They're all verbs. So if I take this word for day, and I make it into a verb, what do I get? Well, one of the meanings is to last for a day, to endure one day in duration. Ben, fundamental issue, well, to treat as the fundamental issue. That's a verb, right? It's an action. It's, it's a, actually an action of the mind, something that you do in, in your view. How about B, the hunting net? What, can I make, what kind of verb can I make out of this hunting net? to hunt with such a hunting net, right? It's very straightforward. Go hunting with a bee net. There's another way to write it, but it's the same word. And chu, the state of chu, here and there appears as a verb, which means to behave as is appropriate in the state of chu, maybe to speak chu language or to do the chu things, um, whatever those are. So this is pretty straightforward. These are all words that I think we agree intrinsically they seem to be nouns. But the verb exists, the verb must be derived from the noun. The noun is being used as a verb, fine. It's not a big deal, but let's observe that this is happening. And the other thing happens too, you can get what seems to be a verb, an action or a state, intrinsically, and you find it has noun usage too. And just a few examples, bien, to change or be changed, and as a noun, well, a change or especially a sudden change, a political upheaval, um, an earthquake, chan, to give birth or be born. You like that the active and passive forms are the same. That's very nice too. Um, as a noun, product, production, industry, wang, to hope for or gaze at, wang yue, to look at the moon, you know. Um, aspiration or prestige, how you are gazed at by those below. Um, so, fine, you have nouns and you have verbs, but the nouns can be verbs, and the verbs can be nouns. How do you know what you're looking at? Um, actually, before you have context, you have practice, but context is it. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a much easier thing to learn than programming languages, but it's mostly memorization. Um, the thinking is not as hard as programming, but um, the, the uh, work is, uh, the labor is greater. So context is the sole thing that determines whether a word is a verb or a noun. And I think that's pretty interesting. We don't have a lot of languages like that. Um, when you're reading, and as a teacher, the thing that I try to inculcate is you, you often hold a lot of words in your mind not quite settled as to their part of speech until sometimes it bounces down, it kind of shakes down. Um, and I'll try to give you some examples. I had a little trouble with um, the formatting, I shouldn't have used LaTeX, but there it goes. I wanted syntax trees with lots of things, and um, it, it, we'll see how it works uh, toward the end of the talk. Here's the take home, um, but please don't leave just yet. Classical Chinese part of speech, it's indeterminate, it's malleable, it's completely flexible, it's completely dependent on context. Even if in our souls we feel that it's intrinsic, that sun is intrinsically a noun, of course it's a noun, but in Chinese, Really, there is no way to say, in classical Chinese, no way to say, yes, it's only a noun. It can be a verb just as easily. So is it weird to use a noun as a verb or a verb as a noun? We do this in English quite a lot. Um, you can eye something, you know. You can eye, you can eye a key, right? They eyed my keys. And you can actually make a parlor game out of this. You can then key a truck or a car that has park in your, right, it's uh, not encouraging vandalism, but y you can key things, right, and of course we code, we also key things in. Um, you can truck things, right, um, you could truck a load of palm trees, a load of palms, and you can palm things, you can palm a coin, you can coin a phrase, you can phrase a question, question someone's right, and so on. You can ride a boat, you can boat on the weekend, 
you can weekend in the Hamptons, and you can go on and on until, yes, someone challenges you and says, no, that can't be made into a verb, and then you lose the parlor game. But um, so the point is, English is able to do this to an extent, what Chinese is doing. English is able to, but English itself is pretty unusual in this respect. And if you look at other languages, if you look at Greek, if you look at even Spanish, German, and to say nothing of things like Polish, the Slavic languages, Hindi, Japanese, you simply cannot take a formed noun and use it without change as a verb or vice versa. Chinese, you do this all the time. English, yes, we can, be, we can taste what it's like in English. So, um, in Chinese, essentially every word that is not a grammar particle in classical Chinese can do this. So just, this is really a philosophy question. Should we say there's no difference between nouns and verbs um, in classical Chinese? I think we shouldn't say that. I think it's better to keep two points in mind. One is that um, of ourselves, we feel that there is a difference between noun quality and verb quality. We feel that very strongly. We should recognize that because it can lead us into error because of the second point, which is that it is behavior that determines whether something is a noun or a verb. Behavior in a particular context. And let's look at some contexts now so as to make it clear. Um, so we have atomic noun and verb units. Let's say they're one character in length. Let's say they're one syllable. Um, and how can they be fit together? Well, if we're talking about a, a pair of them, a group of two, you have four possibilities. All the combinations with replacement, VV, VN, NV, and NN, are attested. And they all have meaning. So let me just give you one sample of each to taste. Um, here's the word qinglian. It is a compound of two verbs, I judge. Qing, to be clear, like water, or like your thoughts. Uh, lian, to be honest. And qinglian is in reference to an official, to be incorrupt. So to be clear and to be honest, that becomes a verb to be incorrupt. Okay, lai ke, lai to come, a verb, ke, a guest, well it can be a verb too, but we'll just call it a noun for now. So lai ke, as a verb phrase, means to have guests. It means for there to have come guests, essentially. Fu mu, father, mother. Right. We don't say that. We say father and mother. But notice that this language doesn't always need to put an and word in. It can, you can just say father, mother, and you're saying parents. All right? It's straightforward. Um, and xin suan, here's a wonderful word. Xin, heart. Suan, to be sour. To feel aggrieved. All right. Now, so here are the, all the ways that in two slots, verb and noun can combine, and each of the resulting compounds I have also classified as to verb or noun. Normally, if we were dealing with a natural language, the tradition is to write verb phrase, um, I should have said VP or NP, verb phrase or noun phrase, but I have a reason for not doing that. Um, the reason is that I want to show you that no matter how much compounding you do, you still always end up with a noun or a verb. Um, so here is xin, we saw it a second ago, a noun, heart or mind. Here's kou, mouth. Xin kou, it means what you think and say. That's pretty clear. Ru, a verb to be comparable to, to be like. E, what's the number one? I'm never clear whether we should treat the numerals as verbs or nouns. I, I lean to saying they feel to me more intrinsically verbal, but as I said, that's the thing I have to remember to be careful of. In any case, if it is a verb to start, 
I'm asserting that it is becoming the, the noun one, the object one. Rui, to be as one, to be comparable to one, to be like one. You can then put these two pieces together, the noun shinko, what one thinks and says, and the verb rui, and you get shinko rui, which is a verbal phrase, again, um, to say what one really thinks. And I think the derivation is clear. We're doing this passively. We're not you know, producing new forms. But um, it's quite interesting to me that I, I don't really have need for any parts of speech other than verb and noun in order to talk about all of this. So combining items that I take out of the part of speech set, verb and noun, just produces more examples from the same set. So it is possible, now you're going to challenge me, I need to give you thousands of examples and then you find a counterexample among them, but I, I assert that because of this pattern, this kind of behavior, definitions of verb and noun in this language can be recursive in character. So what I want to do to describe a language is to construct, I said I would use a context-free grammar. There's a reason for choosing this. A context-free grammar is a set of rules that describe how the pieces of the language work together to produce new pieces. Um, it is, what, 60 years old? It came out of the mind of um, Noam Chomsky. He, um, he used it as a foil. He argued, when he presented this, he, he brought it up and he said, this is no good for describing languages. And he explained why. What he wanted to do is he wanted to sell something. He wanted to sell transformational grammar, a much more elaborate and complicated thing. Um, so he introduced this thing that he called phrase structure grammar. And it turned out to be enormously useful to people like us in uh, working with symbolic systems, which computer languages are uh, representative of. Um, and he published important writings on this. The Chomsky grammar and the Chomsky hierarchy are terms that you, you encounter if you study theoretical computer science. It comes from this 1956 article. Um, here he is. This is about how he looked at the time of his paper. A young, recent graduate. Okay. So here is what a traditional linguistically oriented, context-free grammar looks like. This comes right out of Chomsky's paper. It's a tree. The root, or as uh, Donald Knuth has said, since trees don't grow from the ceiling, the stem of the tree is a sentence, the whole thing. And we can analyze it into parts, a noun phrase and a verb phrase. In this case, the noun phrase has two actual words. I've bold-faced them. Actual words that are leaves in a tree like this are called terminals. And the verb phrase has verb and it has a noun phrase after it. It's all quite clear. The point of terminals is they can't have anything below them. They are intrinsically leaf nodes. No further processes act on them in the context free grammar model to produce new kinds of things. So if you write out the rules, that are embedded into this tree, you get rules like this. You say sentence can be rewritten as NPVP, VP can be written as verb NP, and so on. When you get to things like the man, the book, and took, they can't be rewritten anymore. Those are terminals. And um, once all of, your ter all of your leaves are filled with the terminals, you have a finished sentence. So the key ideas in what Chomsky was presenting is a, we have terminals and non-terminals. And um, non-terminals can be reanalyzed. He called it rewriting until terminals are reached. That's what it's about. That's how you make the grammar. Of course, it has to fit the evidence. But you and I have recursion available, as I showed you in classical Chinese. So we don't need to distinguish terminals and non-terminals at all. Um, let me show you how I would write a rule for what I described earlier, the interchangeability of part of speech, noun, and verb. Well, noun can be reanalyzed as verb, and verb can be reanalyzed as noun. These are rules that apply, and here I have just stated it. 
in the, uh, the sort of flat form of the context-free grammar. The fact that this recursion shows up in the fact that a given part of speech can be on either side of this arrow. Let me put in the two syllable forms that I described a little while ago, you know, the, the uh, xin suan, be aggrieved, and so on. We have these. Basically, um, among the verbs, we have three things, and among the nouns, we have this one thing. This was fu mu at the bottom, was parents, was noun. Okay. So, yeah, and I, I didn't want to say sentence anymore because since we're being recursive, we don't care where we start in the analysis. Wherever we start, that becomes the stem of the tree. That's a string of some sort. Okay, so some characteristics of this system to reiterate. Noun and verb types in context are interchangeable, or rather, I should have said out of context, they're interchangeable depending on context. Second, combination with repetition to produce two element groups. And there's a third thing that I'll introduce on this slide, weighting of the elements. What does that mean? Each pair of parts of speech can either be, as I showed it to you, plain, or there can be a subordinate relationship in which the first one describes the second one, the second one is the main one. And let me show you just what it looks like. I'll use the same um, format here. Qing tan. Qing to be clear, tan to chat. Well, this means to chat in a clear way, to chat with clarity. It means specifically to chat about philosophy. It comes from, this word comes from a particular time, but clear modifies, it is subordinate to tan, the second syllable, which is the main point of the compound. If you had to say what's going on, well, chatting is going on. Well, how is it going on? Well, it's going on in a clear way. But clear, we want to say this is an adverb. We don't need to because there's nothing intrinsically adverbial about it. It is verbal in quality, and it's describing how chat takes place. Another example, like, oh, we saw this word before. Well, to come plus guest can mean a visitor. I said earlier it can mean to have visitors. So it's the same issue that the verb and the noun, they're interchangeable. The derivations are different for the two different meanings that this one word can have. This turns out to be extremely common, even in compounds. Here's another one, Tang Yin, Tang Dynasty plus sound. We're really talking about sound. It's described by Tang, the sound of the Tang. That's, that means Tang poetry. So, and here, oneself and to know. To know is the main thing, to possess knowledge of self. It is in a selfward direction, perhaps. Self-wise knowing, to know in a self-wise way. So the self just simply modifies the action of to know. So, if I add this extra feature that I just described, weight, here's what I end up with. We now have six items in the verb category. We have five in the noun. And that is classical Chinese grammar. That's all there is. That's all we can do. It turns out that's all we need to do if we know how these things are applied. This does not look like a natural language as analyzed by a more complicated linguistic system like transformational grammar or what have you. I mean, structuralism. There is something structuralist about this. Actually, I think that one of the reasons Chomsky wanted to attack this is it looks very structural. The structuralists liked, um, his teachers were all structuralists. Um, they liked very neat systems like this. Because we have recursion, um, we can build very complex strings with these few forms. But this is the whole of the grammar, um, he said with a caveat that he would say later. We usually don't see recursion going down very, very deeply because this has to be processed by a human mind. So, you know, two or three levels down and they don't go any further. Um, usually there are um, sequences of things. There are series of verbal expressions. Um, and the whole thing is loose and very poetic. Um, but the point is, all the possibilities, given these two units, V and N, 
given waiting and given two spots, we have all eight possibilities produced, filled out. And each one is distinct and each one is meaningful. So I had, like he, I had this expression that had two different ways to analyze it. Um, to have guests or a guest from elsewhere, um, it's very common to see this in Chinese. And there's a special class of words, a small class, particles that help you disambiguate when you need to. They're called empty words in Chinese. They don't fit into the categories verb and noun. And um, I will show you how a couple of these work. There are just a few. Well, you know, there are several dozen, but it's few compared to everything else. We might say renxin, person plus heart. These are nouns. And then we don't know if we're saying people's hearts and minds or um, people and hearts. Oh, I see I've got the parts of speech reversed here. People and hearts should be n, n. People's hearts and minds is basically minds, hearts and minds described by people, associated with people. If we need to specify which of these two things we mean, we have a particle we can stick in the middle. Both of these forms appear all over the place in the texts. Renjushin, that tells us that it is the xin, the hearts associated with people. That disambiguates when we need to. We can stick these little particles in. Here's another one, shi ji. It could be two noun phrases, coordinate, seasons and sacrifice. Or it could be seasonal sacrifice, in which sacrifice is the main point and season merely describes it. It could be to sacrifice and to do it described by season at the right season or from season to season. Or it could be that time is actually the verb and it means to make timely the sacrifices. And there might even be other possibilities, but um, this will do for four things. How do you know what it means? Well, context. But if context won't help you, the author can put in a particle to help you. And they would do it like this, yi shi ji. Both of these phrases appear, again, all over the literature. So it means to sacrifice at correct times. Um, digression. What is this context-free grammar anyway? What a crazy name. Why did he call it this? Well, he didn't. He called it a phrase structure, which was actually clearer. Being free of context has to do with the fact that these rules can apply to anything that can be fed into them. Anything that can be put in as input, doesn't matter if it's a whole sentence or a tiny little subpart, can be put in. And you don't need to think about what surrounds the word or the words, the, the context, in order to conduct the analysis, in order to run the rule and get output. Um, he wanted to have a rule so that if you had a sentence, the man ate the food, and the food was eaten by the man, there would be a, a way to relate these, like the, the ate and was eaten, um, and all the other differences. And for this reason, he um, produced and described and, and, and promulgated transformational grammar. Eat and, uh, eat and ate and eaten are different forms of the same word. You, you have to have something complicated to handle words that have multiple forms, the same word, multiple forms. Furthermore, was eaten, you know, um, you've got to have other words appearing, like was, to be eaten. You can't say to be eat, right? You have to, to be eaten. There's all of this change that has to take place. That's context. And for that reason, for a language like English, you need, if not transformational grammar, then something comparable to it. Well, classical Chinese does not have these features anywhere. It never changes the form of its words, ever. And it never requires one or two extra things to make sense out of it. So, classical Chinese is not of the order of complexity of your typical natural language by which, you know, in the Chomsky school, English is the only thing we always, we structuralists always said they only knew English. Um, so classical Chinese is not of the order of complexity of a language like English that requires a transformational grammar. It can be succinctly and fully described. The core can be fully described by a context-free grammar. It is like a programming language in that respect, in that extreme simplicity. So I've got a recap of the important points. What I don't want to do is run out of time before there are um, time for questions. 
So that's really the end of the talk. Um, this will be posted soon and you can argue with me. Um, I do want to thank the people who, um, particularly Rose Ames, who um, bullied me into submitting this talk. She didn't think I'd be uh, accepted, but there you are. Um, <laughs> however, um, I do want to point out, if you're a specialist in Chinese or in linguistics, if you want to argue with me, I'd love it. I have um, six points or seven points for contention at the end of this, uh, these slides, and there are more that we could um, handle. Um, so uh, do look at the slides or come and fight with me. I'm here until Sunday night. And um, I did promise you some examples of nouns changing into verbs and so on. So, um, I tried to do this quickly and the uh, software didn't cooperate too much, but the sun appears in the east, sun, a noun. Look at the bottom uh, level of this tree. Sun and emerge, that means, um, well, it means the sun emerges, but we need it to be a noun, so we say the emergence of the sun. The sun's emerging, the sun's rising. And to be located at the east, okay, it takes place in the east, okay, and you put it together. This is an example of sun being a noun. I'll give this to you just to whet your appetite for sun being a verb, and here it is, not to last a day. Sun, day, becomes a verb when it's negated. A negative particle is like a verb. It turns the, verb, the, the, the word that follows it into a noun, uh, uh, rather into a verb. To, to not day it means to not last a day, it has to to not last a day. Once you have the negative before it, it becomes a verb to last a day. And so this is to complete it under the conditions of not lasting a day. And this is you know, from the philosopher Mencius. He says the people will get the work done in a day. Okay. This is an example of you see, you see day, you see sun, and you say, well, that's a noun. I know that's a noun. It's a safe noun. It's not safe. You negate it, it's a verb right away. Furthermore, it and the negative are just simply modifying something that come after it. Um, the state of chu, and I said there's a verb to behave as appropriate in the state of chu, and there's a great one-liner in Mencius. Ri ta er qiu qi chu. Okay, so day to beat, subordinating particle, to seek his her, to behave as in chu. So I couldn't get this all onto one tree, um, this was a lot of my life was spent trying to do that. Um, yes, LaTeX is wonderful. Um, everything seems easier after LaTeX. Um, so day plus to beat, this is to beat daily. Anybody here have children? Okay, we use this subordinating particle to tell us that ta is going to describe how whatever comes after is done. Seek, qi chu, the situation um, that they behave as they should in chu. They're chewing, it says. His or her behaving as in chu. To be daily under those circumstances, to seek their behaving as they should in chu. In other words, to be daily, thus to seek them to behave as they should in chu. To want your children to behave as in chu, as though in chu, even if you beat them daily, and he's gonna say it's no use. That's what he's going to say. Okay. Um, I had a, a famous Confucian saying too, but I think it's more important to get questions um, underway. So uh, let's move to questions. Anything special I need to do? Okay, so um, here's the problem with questions. If you're in the back, I may not see you raise your hand and I may not hear. So if back questions come up, if they could be forwarded loudly by the audience, it would help. But I'll start in the front. Where did I see a hand? Second row, please. Oh, yes. Um, so you gave a full grammar. Are there, any, are there any strings that are ruled out by this grammar? Like in English, some strings of words just don't occur. Yeah. Um, so I contend that if you don't worry about the particles, particles are viewed as disambiguating to some extent. Um, then no sentences should be, no observed sentences should be um, ruled out. There shouldn't be anything that's produced, well, um, there shouldn't be anything that's not produced that should be produced, let's put it that way. So what, th we, there's two questions. I, I don't want to use this to produce actual strings. I want to use this to parse strings. So the question is, does a string get fed in that cannot be parsed? 
And the true answer is, it depends on how you have defined your words. Because if you've defined something as a noun in such a way that it, it, it's not clear to you how it becomes a verb, then you're stuck. If you just say sun, you don't understand how it is um, to last for a day. Uh, but in principle, everything that you encounter should be describable by these eight patterns. Yes. Another question. I see you in the middle. Um, so the, uh, you talked about what is the example yes. of, of a word modifying uh, you know, another word and that's the problem. Mm. Yes, if you say, um, you know, uh, the bear eaten the man, um, it's not a correct sentence anymore. So was and by are not functioning the way particles do in classical Chinese. Particles are, in theory at least, optional. They disambiguate what could be a viable sentence without their presence. Now, once you get to very long sentences, you never see them without particles, so it's kind of moot. But when we examine small groups of two, three, four, five characters, if we eliminate particles from there, the rules that I've described still cover all the cases. Whereas in English, you, you, if you don't change eat to eaten or to ate in a different situation, you don't have a grammatical sentence anymore. That's, that's the issue, okay? Yeah, um, trying to find lots of people in different places. Blue in the middle, please. Okay, so you gave two examples of disambiguating particles yes. that serve two purposes. Is it the case that there is a full set of disambiguating particles that make it so that you can tell which rule was employed? Because if so, you've got a great thesis here. Well, um, I wish I did. Uh, some of the particles are themselves ambiguous. Whoever invented this language, you know, there was a theory among the Jesuits in the 18th century that this, the written language was invented by a sage um, to be a written language. This, I've forgotten the, the priest's name who came up with this. And he was just treated as insane. But um, when you think about how condensed and telegraphic this is, it really looks like somebody thought a lot about how to write. It's hard to believe that what we have here corresponded to something that people you know, discursively and redundantly used orally. But about the, um, the uh, ambiguity of the particles, some of the particles are themselves full words in certain contexts. So like, uh, let me get back here to... Uh, well, well um, this one, the j, this one, the middle one, this means to go. It does not mean the person went to the heart. Well, it, it could, you know, if heart was a place, then it could be people went to Xin, the place Xin, it could mean that. So um, the particles, there's not a huge number, um, but their behavior you have to learn by learning many examples and for getting a sense. I think the thing that um, in the classroom in Chinese cities and Chinese speaking countries, um, the problem is that you're expected to memorize lots of examples, whereas thinking about the types of words is more associated with what happened in the United States in the 40s and 50s with the structuralist movement. Parts of speech were not described in Chinese traditionally until a Jesuit-educated person began writing a grammar oh, about 120 years ago. Um, yes, please, in the front. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, like I have an, uh, uh, a tendency to want to analyze this as one plus three. Yes. Uh, and you're just ruling that out. I'm not ruling it out. Um, I'm absolutely not. I'm just quickly trying to give an example of uh, the sun as a noun. I, I absolutely thought about should I give both derivations here or not. Um, there's a reason why two plus two is to be favored. It is not universal, but one of the things that you cannot do with a context-free grammar is talk about prosody, which is the effect of sound on the order of language. And in Chinese, there's a very strong tendency for things to come in twos and fours, and for fours to be made of pairs of two. And so, um, 日出, 
you don't, it happens that this line comes from a series of four character expressions in the Li Ji, in the particular book. And for that reason, when I read it, I feel it's twos. Ri Chu is an expression. It's a, a clear expression, the emergence of the sun, sunrise, and so on. Um, but Chu Yu Dong, absolutely, to emerge um, in the East, yes, that is certainly a legitimate way. It, the thing is, it's ambiguous. So we have to choose. I chose in this case based on prosody, but you are in no way wrong, and I don't exclude it. No, not at all. Um, how are we for time? Pretty much done. Can we have one more? All these people asking questions. So who was it? Uh, there we go. Black shirt in the middle. Yes, okay, so Mandarin definitely contains this system, but it's a superset. It has, for instance, um, a much larger um, application of particles. So unless you're speaking in a very formal way, you don't speak or write without particles. So this j that we mentioned, this thing between person and heart, um, if you need it in Mandarin, you need it, it has to be there. It's like the um, was in was eaten. If you don't have it in there, you are, using ungrammatical Mandarin, that's an example. Um, there are uh, verb final particles, there are four or five important ones that describe aspect, which is the state in which a verb is. Is it done, is it undergoing, is it not yet started? Um, there are a bunch of those and um, they are particles that cannot be dispensed with. Those are two examples. And in Mandarin there's also the separation of units. We have, um, so, Coverb object um, phrases um, sometimes have a great, great distance between um, one thing and another thing, and they actually need to be understood together. Um, it's not like, um, well, it's not like in French where you have the ne verb pas and ne verb rien. You, you have all of these ways of negating for which you need two things that are physically separated, but it's of that type, that there are separated things that need to be understood together. Um, and there are suffixes. You know, Mandarin is not a pure descendant of the written language classical Chinese. It has, first of all, it's a spoken language with all of all that, that entails. And second, it's clear that in the North it hasn't been um, only influenced by Chinese forces. It's been influenced by other languages as well. I fear to keep you past your coffee, so thank you for your attention and your patience. <laughs>